Hi everybody, today we're going to cover how we deal with rotating control volumes which come up a couple of times in different uh, fluid mechanics devices that we want to analyze. So we want to just review our Reynolds transport theorem. We're used to seeing this by now. We have a change within the moving system fixed packet of mass. That's the Lagrangian perspective. We have the change within our control volume where we have a region in space we're interested in. That's the Eulerian perspective. And then we have the things that cross the boundary. <clears throat> Remembering that we're describing the transport of this property, B. So we saw before the two forms of this that are common. One is conservation of mass. The rate of change of mass within the control volume is balanced by the mass that enters and leaves the control volume. And then we have conservation of momentum, where we say that the sum of forces acting on the control volume are equal to the rate of change of momentum within the control volume plus the momentum fluxes as momentum enters and leaves the control volume. Remember that this equation represents three equations, really, three conservation of momentum equations, one for x, y, and z coordinates. So that brings us to our topic, which is, what do we do if the control volume is rotating? We know sometimes from our physics classes and other engineering mechanics classes that when we deal with rotational motion, usually it's easier to deal with torques or moments rather than linear forces. So if I look here, uh, pretend I'm looking at the, down at the top of a sprinkler head that rotates, I could look at a torque on that which is equal to the radius crossed with the force, as you've seen in uh, mechanics. The property that we're interested in this case is then related to r crossed with the velocity. So we're going to skip some of the analysis here and just go right to our momentum equation or our uh, moment of momentum equation, we might call it for the Reynolds transport theorem. So what we see here is that we've got the sum of R cross F on the control volume, this is our torques, equals the rate of change of R cross V within that control volume, plus the rate of R cross V that's entering and leaving the control volume. When we look at this, this will become a little bit more clear. But remember that we do need to pay attention to the right-hand rule here. So if our torque is equal to R cross F, I need to stick my right hand out, pointing in the direction of F. I need to, uh, pointing in the direction of R. I need to curl my fingers around in the direction of F. And then the direction that my thumb points is the direction of the torque vector. Likewise, if it was going the other way, I point my hand out in the direction of R, I curl my fingers around in the direction of F, and then I get my torque vector pointing in the direction of my thumb. So that's just a review of the right-hand rule. Okay, so remember, we're dealing with these three components of the velocity here that we talked about last time for moving control volume. We have V, which represents the absolute velocity seen by a stationary observer. We have the velocity of the control volume itself, and then the velocity of the fluid relative to the control volume. So remember that the uh, velocity relative to the control volume, that's the velocity seen as this jet exits this sprinkler. That's what we need to use when we're looking at finding m dot. We've got the velocity of the control volume. That is the sprinkler tip velocity in the circumferential direction. So how fast is this sprinkler tip rotating around? In uh, physics class, you should have learned that you're able to calculate that as the velocity of that tip equals the radius from the point of rotation out to the point where the motion is occurring times the angular velocity, omega. And then our last guy, the absolute velocity, this is the velocity seen by a stationary observer. And remember, this is what we use where our physical relationships apply. So you can also see the vector equation that we have here. We have our velocity seen by the control volume, our velocity of the control volume, 
and what's left is the absolute velocity as described over here. So it turns out that this can this approach is very convenient and we'll see it a lot when we analyze turbo machines which are a category of devices that include pumps, turbines, fans and things like that. So in terms of alternative energy we might be talking about a wind turbine or a hydraulic turbine that produces power. And we use this word power that's very important in that type of analysis. We represent that with W dot, the rate of work, and we know this expression, that that's equal to the torque times the angular velocity, just in case that's something we need to calculate. Okay, so let's summarize. Here's what our moment of momentum equation looks like uh, for our Reynolds transport theorem. And most of the time we're going to deal with this in a steady state sense. And so we can remember our rate of change with respect to time goes to zero, which gives us this equation. That the sum of torques on the control volume equals the integral over the control surface of R cross V entering and leaving that control volume. And this V is the absolute velocity in this case. And then we have rho W dot N where we have the relative velocity crossing the boundary and we're integrating with respect to that surface area, the control surface area. So some example problems that we're going to do in class, there's two of them. First, we're going to look at this sprinkler that we talked about before. So you can imagine this sprinkler as we're looking at the top, this thing's going to rotate in this direction, and we have water entering it from inside the screen perpendicular to this direction of rotation. So it's entering straight out of the screen. The flow rate, the area of the nozzles, and this radius from the center out to the tip is known. So here's where we know the area uh, that this jet is coming out. And we're asked to find what torque would be required to hold this stationary with the jets shooting out, what torque would be required if we wanted to limit the angular velocity to 500 revolutions per minute, and then what angular velocity would we have if we had no force whatsoever holding it in place. Then the second problem is we're going to look at a centrifugal fan. So here's a side view of this and a top view. And what we know here is a certain flow rate of air enters and leaves the blades. We know the geometry uh, of the blades here in terms of diameter and the height of the blades. And we want to find the uh, power required to run the fan with these known velocities and flow rates. So these are two interesting problems that we're going to work on in class. Thanks for your attention, and I look forward to working on them with you.